Not that you probably would. <laughs> I shot JFK. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's see. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, thank you for joining. I got to open up a drink myself. Yeah. So, um, so people will probably come literally stream in and stream out. Uh, we'll see who comes today. Uh, we usually have a grab bag of people with scientific backgrounds of varying degrees and also people who just like to hang out, like to ask questions. Uh, we have Star Trek fans every once in a while, which is good since the aliens in question today are Star Trek yes. themed. Uh, so I think I explained to you via Discord, but I'll just say again, um, the purpose of the streams that I like to do normally on Wednesdays, today on Thursday because of a because of not wanting to be late due to getting back from a conference. Um, and the I, brain fatigue that accompanies yes, conferences. It, it was really bad coming back yesterday. Um, but, you know, the point is to talk about, you know, science fiction, but also real science. Uh, and when we get to the science fiction part, whenever we get to it, uh, like, I, 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 tr I don't want to make fun of anything. Like, I love that they came up with this idea specifically of, like, the Vidians. I, I love the concept. It's goofy. And, you know, they got some things right. Um, but I'm sure people they, have been thinking about sort of transplanting organs. Uh, in fact, weren't some of the first organs transplanted between animals anyways. I'm sure someone had the thought of, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could use animal organs for humans? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, sort of an early thought, but it was before we understood much about uh, immune incompatibility oh, between yeah. species and even between individuals of the same species. Yeah. Um, uh, hello, Twitch guy too. Welcome. Uh, would you mind actually just introducing yourself? Um, yeah. However much you want to share about what you sure. do, what yeah. you have done. Yeah, so I am Gabe Z. Um, I'm sure you can do your own snooping if you want, <laughs> but I have a PhD in genetics from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. I did a postdoc fellowship at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. And for six years, I was an assistant professor of biology at Indiana University. And in the middle of last year, I graduated my first PhD student, and he joined the company that I now work for, which is called eGenesis, which is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is kind of the biotech epicenter of the world. You've got MIT, you've got Harvard, you've got Tufts, all these universities spinning off companies that are doing very cool stuff. And I am a... Oh, hey, Volpecia is here. Um, so I am a huge Star Trek fan. I mean, <laughs> obviously I'm wearing the, the damn blue shirt. <laughs> yeah. What's your, uh, so what's your background in, in sci-fi? So, or is it, is it just Star Trek? Where did Star Trek start? Well, Star Trek? So PNG started airing in 87. I was born in 85, but my mom loved Star Trek and Star Wars. So I guess when I was of age, whatever that was, we would watch TNG as a family. And then I kind of fell off in the DS9 years and Voyager, and I didn't actually see those in their entirety until I was in college. Oh, yeah. But uh, I remember going to see The Undiscovered Country in theaters with my dad when okay. that came out <laughs> and just loving that. Nice. But, uh, yeah, I I grew up Star Trek. I grew up Star Wars as well, though hmm. that fire has dimmed a little bit as of late. You don't say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, my so my parents are not explicitly sci-fi fans. I think they just kind of like whatever. But my parents' first ever date together was to the first Star Trek movie. My dad took my, that was my dad's choice for their first date, which I feel like is bold. Very, very bold. That's, that's very bold. Especially since, Especially. yeah, I didn't find that's out true. about that until years after I just started watching Star Trek just on my own because I found it on TV. Had no idea. That's amazing. 
And despite the motionless picture, they <laughs> kept it going. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, Star Trek. Yeah, so, you did I, eventually watch, yeah, Voyager and DS9, Deep Space Nine. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I discovered I, TNG as a teenager, but was very. Um, a like, TNG nager? Yeah, exactly. I was very bullheaded wow. in not watching DS9 or Voyager. Yeah. Until I did and realized, wait, these are actually pretty good. These are actually pretty good. And I also only recently watched Enterprise, which deserves a lot more credit than it gets, I absolutely, feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. I rewatched it this past Christmas. I had also seen it as a teenager, which I absorbed everything, more or less, um, sci-fi as a teenager. So I loved it then. It it's a, it holds up better than I thought it was going to, at least after they got rid I, of the decontamination sex chamber that's a such a rick berman (laughs) but i remember seeing the pilot on a vhs recording a friend made for me in high school and i could never i could never catch it on net on the network at the right time but yeah i watched it i think i did the full series in 2019 and was like wow i i missed out but it's good stuff. Yeah, and absolutely. Aside from Star Trek, uh, I'm a big fan of Alistair Reynolds' novels. Okay. Could you name one? Our Revelation Space is probably the big I... one. He I... has he has sort of a, a universe that he writes in mm. frequently, which is Revelation Space. And the, the conceit is that you know humans have made it out to distant stars and they've discovered remnants of other civilizations other alien civilizations but none of them are extant they've been wiped out by i don't know if you've played mass effect Mm -hmm. it's like the reapers you know some intelligence that every so often sweeps the galaxy for sentient beings at x level of technology and grinds them into dust oh okay (laughs) but yeah, I can't and say I've heard of those. I'll I'll add it to my growing list of things that I should have read by now. Well, there. I mean, they get my strong recommendation. And so, I love his stuff. Um, some of Stephen Baxter's stuff I really enjoyed. Mm, yeah. And most recently, uh, She Who Is My Wife and I have been watching For All Mankind. Oh, ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, it's alternate history sci-fi kind of but it's also sort of a character drama as well yeah absolutely which is how we what we like about the expanse also Mm. the expanse is great i have not read the books i need to i'm much more of a tv and movie sort of person but i'll tell you i tried to read the first expanse book sure and i found it i found it very difficult because like the first season of the expanse it's very expansive you get perspectives from everyone but the novel and is only written from the perspective of Holden and Miller, so they alternate chapters. Okay, yeah. So you don't get this like broad panorama of what the solar system is like in uh, that future. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, you might like it. I just, it didn't, the books just didn't hook me. And they're, you know, I wasn't expecting great literature or anything, but... <laughs> After reading like Alistair Reynolds with his, like he has a PhD in astrophysics, I think. Oh, so wow. Okay. Is very very hard sci-fi. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. No, absolutely. Um. Okay. So let's. Why don't we just start into. Uh, that's all great, by the way. That's like I. I love just hearing how people interact with things Mm -hmm. actually one more question before we get into stuff do you feel like any of that led you into science as a career i mean i can't deny that it did for me even if i don't i can't quite say what exactly did it i think i would identify with that statement like i'm not a scientist because of my interest in sci-fi though it certainly didn't hurt yeah and i don't know watching reading sci-fi with a scientific mindset is is kind of a fun thing even though i have to 
turn my brain off when viruses are huge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, last time I had a guest on, um, it was uh, Dr. James Gurney, who is usually in chat, but usually says hello. So I don't think he's on right now. Yeah, he studies um, quorum sensing and phage. So we had some fun oh, cool. talking about uh, <laughs> those macroscopic viruses and, and a variety of viruses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he... Yeah, we've got. Sorry, what go ahead. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> uh, well, I think we were both. We both appreciated that the that the macro virus had like facets and it was a little bit more it was it was a little bit more accurate than you might expect. Although the entire thing of like, oh, they grow because they absorb uh, like hormones or something like that, growth hormones. We were like, uh, OK, there's, why? there's a line. There's a clip I've been using in drops that I've been making. It's about when Dr. Crusher is giving Riker the recipe for a warm milk toddy because mm. he can't sleep in Shizumj. And she says something about the heat activating the amino acids in the lactose. And I'm just like, <laughs> no! <laughs> Those but, are two different things. You know, it's like, that's not a... But they they said the words. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm happy sometimes when they just say the correct words. Um, There was something mm -hmm. just in strange new worlds and i'm forgetting they did something similar it, it they just grabbed this the the biology words out of a hat and sometimes it makes a little oh, bit more sense uh, yeah. like the first the pilot of strange new worlds where they they had the loaf gun you know, you oh right hypo spray and they start to look like the kyleans yeah the, something like that is, like did you edit every cell in their faces <laughs> what did you do it's just a silicone implant actually it's not actually yeah. anything yeah <laughs> but well uh whatever that's neither here yeah, nor that's, there no no um, we need to be in the delta quadrant yeah um so first and foremost since we're talking about transplantation i wanted to mention one thing because i mention it to everybody as as much as i can when i can which is everyone should go sign up to be a bone marrow donor. I was lucky enough to be selected less than a year ago. So I donated uh, peripheral stem cell, bl wait, peripheral blood stem cells. That's how that goes. Yeah, uh, that's great. That's could, fantastic. Shockingly easy. I mean, it was a, f I mean, I was lucky enough to respond very well to the uh, uh, fil filgrastim that injections that y they give you. Um, so I was only laying down like this for, maybe an hour and a half effectively That's enough time cool. to run the cell counting to see how 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 well i responded by the time they got that they were like oh uh he's done he's uh, a responder yeah so but yeah that's uh me with a sack of my stem cells right there got sent off very out outsized like amount of easiness for me versus like how it probably impacted some random person yeah, but yeah, it's super important. And the place where I did uh, my postdoc, Fred Hutch in Seattle, is where bone marrow transplantation was originally developed. Now, are you? Do you mean like the old style with the big needle and like the large flat bones? Yeah, I assume. The, yeah, yeah, it's not the more modern version. Yeah. Um, well, actually, so then that's a perfect segue. Um, uh, you put this slide on here, so I don't want to like assume that you know, um, but I did take a look at a little bit of this. But what do you know about the history of just transplantation? So, yeah, the history of transplantation, you know, I have done, well, a quick study <laughs> because of my newer job. So where I really uh, got into it was because of the the very recent news of Mr. Bennett getting a pig heart transplant. I was yes. curious about the first uh, heart allo transplant, an allo transplant being transplant between members of the same species. So the first heart transplant between humans was performed in South Africa in um, late to sorry yeah no look things um, up it's 
Yeah. Uh, uh, well, 1967. Nice. Okay. Performed in South Africa. And the, the crazy thing is the patient only survived for 18 days. Yeah. This is a human heart into a human. Mr. Bennett, a human, survived with a pig heart for almost two months. Wow. So that's that's pretty crazy. Uh, while you have it up, if you just look that up, how did how did the uh, first heart transplant? How did they end up passing? D do they um, did they, they know? Believe. I mean, was it a rejection of the heart or was it? Um, he got pneumonia. Okay. So I would suspect that had something to do with compromising the immune system yeah. during the procedure. Something not directly to literally having a different heart yeah. put into them, but as a result of the newness of the technique. It doesn't look like it was a, a rejection event. Hmm. And they're also not entirely sure why the pig heart was rejected in the David Bennett case. Yeah, I mean, we can skip straight ahead to that because if that provides like a good like well, backdrop. So what was the next? Um, actually, I think Xeno Trans. The next slide is actually probably oh yeah perfect for <laughs> jumping since I defined Xeno transplantation on the next. Slide. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so get rid of that notification that just popped up so any procedure that involves the transplantation implantation or infusion of a human recipient of either live cells tissues or organs from a non-human source or human body fluids cells tissues or organs that have been oh that have had ex vivo contact with non-human animal cells tissues or organs that's i forgot about that b1 when i read this originally yeah. what does what does that mean I mean, I, 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 sorry. So, uh, a lot of it is pancreatic islet cells for diabetes. Oh. So there's a lot of, uh, thought of using pig islets to generate insulin because, you know, a lot of the insulin that's used to treat diabetes is recombinant artificially produced pig insulin. Yeah. So we know it's compatible with humans but if we can actually take you know a human well put pig pancreatic islets into the human pancreas or implant them or put them in the blood and figure out a way to get them to a safe space oh, i see um but you know, pig skin has been used for burn graft because the skin is not very immunogenic. Yeah. Um, uh, well, eugenesis's major focus is actually on using pig kidneys for kidney failure because the largest gap between human organ availability and transplant need is for the kidney. Really? I don't, yeah. I don't think I actually had the numbers in here. Oh, that's fine. Um, but... Uh, Actually, so I have a, I have a probably pretty basic question. <clears throat> sure. Why pigs? So, uh, several reasons. Um, physiologically speaking, their organs are of similar size to ours. That is um, important. Yeah. Uh, genetically, you know, they're highly conserved with us. Though, as we'll probably discuss, they're not perfectly immunologically compatible. Yeah. But the size, availability, um, those are kind of the major reasons. Um, is is there, I, I kind of just assumed another reason, and so please correct me if I'm wrong, is also just, uh, what's the right word? If it was cells or microorganisms, I'd say culturing, like, yeah, right. Uh, we know husband, how to husbandry. Husbandry. Yeah. yeah we need. Pigs, yeah. We know how to take care of thousands or millions, even of of pigs, yes, rather than. Yes. Per, so I I had yeah. been curious about this. You know, if we had, barring the probably ethical concerns that at least I would have, if we could keep chimpanzees, well, 
in huge quantity. Yeah, like that's we, that's another thing. It's we know how to maintain large herds of pigs. Caring for of various types of non-human primates is extremely expensive. And you're right, ethically speaking, people are far less concerned with pigs than chimpanzees or macaques or yeah. baboons. Though baboons have been used as a model for, actually, as a model for cardiac xenotransplantation. They've taken pig hearts and put them into baboons to see how they do. Really? I mean, I suppose I would want something to be done in primates prior to humans. I am trying to think how big a baboon is. I thought they were pretty small. Um, I guess so, do they take smaller hearts. So in our studies that we do in non-human primates, some of which are published and some of which we're working on publishing, for transplantation into NHPs, non-human primates, we take juvenile pig hearts. Okay. Oh. After about six to eight weeks post-birth, but for them to get to the size comparable to a human heart, it would take six to eight months. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah. So it's just a a timing thing. So for those studies. I'm, I'm like imagining in my my head like the triangle of baboons to humans to pigs is the conservation of response to and I don't know what the right word like immunogenic factors on the pig close enough on baboons and humans that we're we're like really confident in results from that relative to yeah. you know like the distance between baboons and sure. pigs and pigs and humans is relatively similar yeah. or that's right. my question. We yeah, so the next slide kind oh, of addresses that. I didn't mean to do that, but that's great. Oh, that's, I'm just going right, to make this yeah. a little bigger. Yeah, this barriers to xenotransplantation slide. Oh, cool. You can kind of get at that. So as I, I'm sure you and everyone else on the stream knows, uh, you know, our mammals and to some extent, uh, other animals have immune systems. Heck, I guess even bacteria have immune systems with CRISPR. To a degree, as yeah. We, <laughs> as we say in Boston. Now, when you edit in the genome, you're going to want to use CRISPR. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the immune system provides defense against pathogens. Yeah. That's why, you know, we get our COVID vaccine, hopefully. You know, we get an mRNA molecule, our cells make the spike protein, our body's like, that's not supposed to be there, and mounts an adaptive immune response. So what's been found is that pig cells on their surface actually have several factors called antigens, which are molecules that stimulate the immune response, uh, that primates, including humans, have antibodies against. Mm. For whatever reason, we have developed antibodies against these pig surface antigens, um, possibly because they uh, resemble things that are found on the surface of um, bacteria. Um, so we have these preformed antibodies against things that are on pig cell surface. And if you just, you know, put a pig organ into a human, you'll have what's called hyperacute rejection. It doesn't Basically, sound good. <laughs> it's not like you'll see a perfectly healthy kidney basically turn black in oh. 10 to 15 minutes. Wow. Yeah. So the reaction is incredibly strong. So the and antibody and antigen um, pairs or, 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 or the response, that seems, that's specific? It's not just a non-specific, you know, you put no, this big organ in. Okay, so. It's very, it's very specific. And so what we have to do is use CRISPR gene editing to yeah. knock out the genes that encode the proteins that create these so-called xenoantigens in pigs. Yeah. And so. Oh, Ms. Frizzle asked yeah. what the screening process is. 
to make sure viruses or pathogens be transferred. So that's actually kind of an ongoing question. There's a question in Mr. Bennett's case about porcine cytomegalovirus or CMV infection. Um, was that con be. was that confirmed? I mean, so it was found. Uh, not, um, no, if it was a. I don't think it was an. It was one of the findings in autopsy. There was screening beforehand, but. Yeah. The screening was by nasal swab, which will only detect if you have an active infection. So yeah. we and the rest of the xenotransplantation field are working on ways to monitor what we call adventitious agents, you know, harmful microbes, viruses that may come along for the ride with uh, an organ that's transplanted and might be harmful to the recipient. And so this infectious barriers box is yeah they would screen the pigs by nasal swab before uh, taking out the donor organ and so we're we're trying to implement you know stronger screening you know by doing some kinds of pcr testing or something like that yeah but one of the biggest concerns with uh porcine to human transplantation is these porcine endogenous retroviruses or PERVs. <laughs> um, so, you know, retroviruses can jump around yeah. within a genome. Yes, there are lots of pathogens in... <laughs> yeah, yeah, PERV is, it's quite the name. We... We tried to go with Cisgrofa endogenous retrovirus, SSERV, but PERV was, it just stuck. <laughs> so what's going on here seems pretty pervy, doesn't it? <laughs> so uh, one of the technologies that the company was founded on yeah. is the ability to eliminate the function of 60 to 70 copies of this retrovirus in the genome simultaneously really so is it the same is it the same retrovirus that's mobilized within the the pig genome but when it's enters it when you put it in a human body it mobilizes even but, further well it's been shown only so it's never actually been shown in vivo they've shown that if you cold culture uh pig kidney epithelial cells with hec 293 human embryonic kidney maybe epithelial cells yeah you can detect uh perv genomes in the human genomes of the hex cells okay however we don't know if that actually happens in vivo and because excuse me because the transplants have all been done in non-human primates it's we can't really tell if it's actually a risk because non-human primates actually don't highly express the receptors that per virions need to enter the Interesting. cell. Interesting. Okay. They've wow. co-opted riboflavin transporters for entry. Yeah. So this but, is, I'm trying to think. So there's how, hmm. I'm trying to formulate my question. We humans have been around pigs for a long time, obviously. Uh, primarily for consumption, but we've been in close proximity. How, yeah. but we have no documented historical evidence of a human ever being infected by the, uh, the pervs. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what I mean? Like it seems, it yeah. seems, it seems kind of- is it, act is it actually a risk? Yeah, because it seems funny that it's, it seems like, wow, that seems really bad. What a, what a shame that it happens to be in pigs. But then how have we never, you know, someone gets a cut while, while, while butchering a pig or something like that. And then, yeah. You know, not, not being a virologist, I, I couldn't say if that <laughs> method of transmission would, would work. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, this is, this is the case where all it takes is one, like if yeah. you do one transplant. So several. The company 
that provided the pig for the heart transplant, they don't do this because they can't. They don't have the genome engineering expertise to knock out several dozen pervs yeah. in one go. Hmm. But uh, again, all it takes is one, and the FDA really thinks it's important to remove that potential risk. Absolutely. It's that prudent avoidance kind of approach. Yeah. So I guess with the ideal, is the ideal then to sort of breed and using biotechnology and, uh, uh, you know, clean room based methods of, of rearing pigs to engineer out a pig that has none of these immunogenic surface cell factors also has these these retroviral elements either silenced or otherwise removed and then and then but then you have to keep it that way right I yeah, just... we have to eventually get them into a designated pathogen free facility yeah. where there's screening for hundreds of adventitious agents performed regularly but i will say we have made pigs that are lacking functional copies of three genes responsible for xenoantigens as well as dozens of copies of pervs really and in addition we add in human genes hmm. to make the cells look more human so in addition to depigifying the cell surfaces <laughs> we try to make them look more human because that's another thing the immune system does it discriminates self from non-self like yeah. all of our cells have certain markers that tell the immune system like hey hey i'm supposed to be here yeah and so if you do that for pig cells you can uh, make them less susceptible to immune attack do these happen to be the same genes by any chance are you swapping out or, or or is it is it supplementing? Oh, it's it's a different set of genes. Okay. So the three the three knockouts are genes involved in the synthesis of these surface antigens. Mm. They tend to be carbohydrates that modify specific sure. proteins. Yeah. So you get rid of these glycosyl transferases, and you drastically reduce the immunogenicity of the pig cells. And the human proteins we put in provide resistance to apoptosis, complement-mediated cell death, as well as um, in what is the other one? Yeah, complement apoptosis and inflammation, and also some other cell surface proteins. I'm not an immunologist. I'm <laughs> still really kind of getting my sea legs with sure. this, but. We just try to make the cells look as human as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And this is so far not. Is this in? Is this in a pig tissue culture, or is this in in actual? These are actual pigs, pigs and on they're, the ground. They're fine. I mean, more they or less. Are. Phenotypically, are. happy, healthy pigs. Yeah, yeah, they are. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I mean, I mean, it's not e it's not easy. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Our, we have a paper published using an old version of our transgenic strategy where the longest survivor made it out to 316 days. I was okay. a crab-eating macaque who had a native nephrectomy, had the native kidneys removed, yeah. had a pig kidney put in and survived for just shy of a year. Wow. That's amazing. Um, any chance you can send me the link to that paper? Uh, yeah. Do the PubMed we go. If I can, if I can get a, if I can open that right now, that'd be kind of cool. But um, also, that um, sounds amazing. Um, yeah, I can get. Yeah. It's not a big deal if if you can't. And now I, I got it. Um, All right. What would be the easiest way for me to? Um, I can send you the PDF for the link. I don't know. The if... PDF would be great. You can do that via um, a direct message here on Discord. Okay. So you can... If I... Whoops. Okay. I forgot okay. that I'm streaming my screen. Okay. So here's... Come on. Cook wouldn't be having... Wait, wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. Says uh, Volpezia. 
Also, welcome, Volpezia. Yeah, I saw you um, say hello before, but I didn't say hello. Got to play the draft. <laughs> I uh, I have a a explicitly not fancy, but a uh, a little doodad right here that, if I want, can play sound effects. Oh, you got a um, soundboard. Yeah, yeah, well, it's it's mostly for the lights that I have right here, so I can like change the lights on command. Uh, um, I had one. Let me see if this works. Is that gonna work for me? Oh, it doesn't work on this one. Never mind. I uh have one soundboard element, but I forgot to turn it on for today. So, oh well. Okay. Oh, you sent, sent it to me? That. Okay. I sent you the, well, that's the link to the page. My, I don't know why my browser is being a pain in the butt about downloading the PDF. That's fine. I'll see if I have access to it sometimes. Yeah. I'm, I'm milking my IU credentials for all they're worth. <laughs> I'm still using the. Yeah, I, uh. My um, institution recently decided that they only needed like 75% of the journals that they used to, uh, you know, pay for. And I don't work at a small university. They uh, just decided we don't oh. need it. There it is. Yeah, I've got it right here. So, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so this, yeah, this is a, a previous generation of what we call payload. Yeah which is the human genes that get knocked in. But um, in this case, they were actually randomly integrated mm. into the pig genome. Uh, is it a little bit more directed nowadays? Oh, and I don't know how much you can actually say because of, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, so don't don't yeah. say something if you don't can't or don't all, want this to. This is published. Okay. So, and there's actually, hang on a second. There's another, there's a paper that accompanies this that actually describes the engineering that was done and this should be okay okay download please okay and so it was integrated randomly into the genome of the piggyback transposes yeah. system but now we take the safe harbor approach or you know use CRISPR to precisely insert things into regions that are um, not known to have any important physiological functions. And presumably are far enough away from like centromeres and telomeres yes. to prevent from being that's, silenced. That's exactly it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose the genetic tricks in pigs are probably not as... Uh, Extensive as mice, Drosophila, C. elegans. Yeah. I hadn't really thought and, about that. And the the timing is uh, is tough because yeah. the gen yeah pigs take a while to reach reproductive maturity, and all of these pigs were not bred. They're made by somatic cell nuclear transfer, like Dolly the sheep was. Nice. And the way the pigs that donated the organs for this study were created through sequential rounds of somatic cell nuclear transfer. So oh, really? figure one of this nature biomedical engineering paper, you've got fibroblasts that were derived from a pig ear. You put in Cas9 in your guide RNAs, yeah, as well as the piggyback transposes and your donor vector with the human transgenes you make a population you do cell sorting you get clones that have all the desired edits you do a somatic cell nuclear transfer you get a pig that has knockout of the three xeno antigen genes as well as knock in of your um, human genes and then you go to the perv knockout. Yeah. So you take an ear notch from this transgenic pig, isolate fibroblasts, and do this 
massive genome wide perv knockout. And then you do the same protocol again. So you isolate a single cell that has all the edits you want, do somatic cell nuclear transfer, and you wind up with the blue pig here. Yeah. Wow. I, and, yeah, wow. I hadn't realized that we. So when I think of cloning, I'm thinking of molecular cloning yes, all day long. Yes. I so do not think about the 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 ability do uh, dolly cloning. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not just that, but recursively dolly cloning, right? Because it's yeah. just yes. a clone of a clone yes. of a clone. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen Stargate, but we've talked about yes. um, the Asgard on there and their problems with that. Although that's Over. something that's something else. Um, yeah um this is the, that's amazing also panel b an image of the the perv yeah, ko the, 3ko t yeah. 9 tg pick that's uh, that's yeah, that's amazing cute. and clones but of each the, other right or, yes. or or co clones they're also clones yes yes yeah. they are co clones <laughs> <laughs> wow and, uh, the pro the trick is that these are primary cells so when you uh you, know, you isolate these gear notch fibroblasts they only have a finite number of divisions and culture yeah i i bet you're not establishing stable lines from no. these guys wow you don't want to immortalize these <laughs> no. you know, cancer oh what breed of pigs are we typically using so in the initial studies they were called bama pigs i think they're a chinese breed oh yeah i've heard of them that's a which, if yeah. I've heard of them, has to mean that they're probably pretty common. Yeah. So we have switched to using mini pigs. Uh, one breed we like is the Yucatan, hmm. which, you know, only gets to like 40 or 50 kilograms as an adult. Our, so other companies, like the folks who made the pig for the heart transplant, use the breed called Large White, which is like big honking farm pig. But they have to do an additional edit, which is not good. They have to knock out the growth hormone receptor so that the pigs don't get too big. Oh, yeah. But there is a paper that I found that shows that knocking out the growth hormone receptor basically makes a pig model of this particular human metabolic disorder. So. Huh. Wow. It's, it's probably not a good strategy for getting the right size organs yeah. but you know they they have their funding to do it so i mean and these are so pig breeds aren't isogenized by any stretch of the imagination but they are pretty homogeneous in terms of uh well genetic variation it, or it more depends is that is that a consideration that you want so Yucatan is actually a pretty highly inbred breed of pig because mm -hmm. when they are originally imported, I think only 50 individuals were brought into the country and they were split up three ways. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that's, that's a bit of a bottleneck. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, wow, we're actually doing some, some genotyping of the, uh, uh, yes, selective breeding of big pigs for fast yeah for agricultural pigs yeah definitely but you don't want giant organs for no. people and these growth hormone receptor knockout pigs some of their physiology is fragile like their ureters you know connecting the kidneys to the where the pee comes out <laughs> they get they get a uh, fragile interesting so so has there been any talk maybe of going backwards finding um you know the wild strains of 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 pig relatives or ancestors um to sort of well, account for if we've selectively bred some things that maybe aren't so great for the organs to go backwards a little bit it's possible so we're doing a lot of whole genome sequencing right now because no one has actually sequenced the Yucatan genome. Oh, and nice. in particular, not, not the isolate that we've been using. Yeah. 
Um, so we're looking for things that might decrease the incompatibility with human transplantation, though I cannot give too many details. Yeah, un yeah, that's understandable. But yeah, uh we're suffice it to say we're constantly trying to make it so that our pigs will be more compatible. Yeah, and not. It is the other goal. So you have these clones of clones, and that that's. Um great for this iterative process of de-pigifying and human humanizing i can't say that word humanizing humanizing that i was putting a g in it humanizing pigs uh once Why you get this name is racist yeah <laughs> once you get this pig at the end these clones um are in your company other companies are they making enough of them that they can then be bred together to make a stable population okay. rather than having to keep on cloning single pigs at a time. That's, that's the, uh, ev eventual idea. Mm. You know, the scale of this is something that really has to be worked up once. I mean, the goal now is to do like a real controlled FDA clinical trial. Yeah. And so there's a lot of, uh, legwork that goes into the logistics of that you know getting meetings with the fda is difficult um building this designated pathogen free facility difficult also expensive <laughs> yeah so the goal eventually would be for there to be like you know a giant pathogen free facility someplace where these pigs can be bred at scale for donor organs basically yeah i'm just scrolling through the rest of this the nature biomedical engineering mm -hmm. uh what is the vector name again I yeah I, I i don't yeah all miss frizzle what did you mean by the vector name i kind of missed what you were referring to i guess i hey. guess the pla the plasmid name but i didn't i didn't i don't think i didn't think i showed that unless you found this paper yourself um Oh, got some stains. Of, they a little bit of everything in this paper. Nice. I will definitely share these to my Discord um, because you sent me another one that doesn't seem to have downloaded. The other, the other one was the transplant study for the oh. pigs that were generated here with the macaques. Yes. Right. Ah. Okay. I'm just. Okay. I see. I see. And my so computer just opened see, up multiple pages gotcha the you can see in figure one of that ajt paper yeah i'm oh. having to learn all these new journal acronyms too. <laughs> um, there is immunosuppression that goes on following the xenotransplant just because while we account for most of the xeno reactivity by knocking out those three genes it's not complete yeah Wh which one of these um, treatments is that so the anti cd 54 okay anti cd 154 or cd 40 and the mmf all of these various things oh are these are all oh i see the figure title is immunosuppressive yeah. regimen ah yes. should have read the title of the figure huh. wow okay that's cool. Yeah, I'll share this one too. This one has um, There's some pretty pictures in Figure Three too. Absolutely, showing that things actually do get expressed. Yeah. In the kidney. So let's see. We have wild type uh, down here, and then we have multiple different genes up at the top. Yeah. Uh, TKOA and B are oh human proteins. Oh. I see. So TKOs are ones lacking the GGTA, B4 gal, NT2, and CMA genes, okay. which encode glycosyl transferase is responsible for those major xenoantigens. I see. Okay. Cool. And CD46, 55, and 59 are involved in protection of cells from complement-mediated attack. Hmm. Okay, cool.
Wow. I mean, I, I believe that it's, it's, it's iterative and it's slow, but it's working, right? It is. It's, it's working. Like, and what I like to say is that it's not a question of if it's a question of when for humans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had our first yeah. transplant. I mean, right. Per, first modern. I, I, I was trying to look up cause I thought I had read somewhere a long time ago that, uh, transplantation of, of animal organs into humans did happen before um, as very early steps in transplantation technology but they were f abject failures but I couldn't yes. then find that so if you know anything about that um, I really need to brush up on my history <laughs> you know I think let's see oh here we go in 1963, doctors at Tulane University attempted chimpanzee to human renal transplantation. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there was a. Oh, after this failed and several others failed, interest in xenotransplantation for kidney failure dissipated. <laughs> well, I so bet. One, one worked for nine months, one out of 13. Oh. Worked for nine months. Okay. And so, but this is this is the interesting thing. It says that autopsy, the chimpanzee kidneys appeared normal and showed no signs of acute or chronic rejections. Hmm. So. I mean, that's that's sort of the thing that I sort of was suggesting before is uh, it would kind of make sense in a world where we didn't care about ethics and had infinite resources chimpanzees probably would be the best starting point they are the most similar um evolutionarily speaking right but they would be but, more immunologically compatible presumably presumably but who i mean who who knows um there could yeah, be no, nobody knew anything about this uh you know immune incompatibility at the time absolutely i don't know if you've heard of um was it the MHC, the major histocompatibility yeah. complex. So that was named because of its discovery during transplant rejection, though we now know that it's that name actually really elides its function as the you know, identifier of an organism's a mammal's own cells as self and also help present viral or other pathogenic antigens. So the the MHC is kind of misleadingly named, <laughs> and there there is a pig MHC, yeah, encoded I, by the wine lymphocyte antigen loci. Hmm. And does that do you know if that provides or causes problems for transplantation? Uh, it's definitely responsible for some of the remaining immunoreactivity. Yeah, but we can't knock it out because the pigs will get sick while they're growing uh. so for something like pancreatic islets where it's neonatal islets yeah. that we're after it wouldn't be such a big deal but if we need to let the pigs grow for six to eight months we can't have them in a like an a environment like a germy and well hopefully there wouldn't be a lot of germs around because it's a pathogen free facility yeah. but <laughs> um they're extremely susceptible to infection if you get rid of these SLA, these pig NHCs. We've done in vitro work on that, and we're doing some work to see if our particular pigs we're using have alleles of the NHC that are more or less immunogenic to human immune cells and culture. Yeah. Huh. Wow. That's, I mean, it sounds like unsurprisingly you, the collective, you all are coming at this from every, every angle that we know of at this point, right? There's, mm. uh, I, are you, what do you, but what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to hit some acceptable minimum? Like what's, what's the bar we're trying to hit? I mean, with the, so, with, yeah. I think, the idea is that xenotransplantation would be a bridge to an allo transplant. The hope being that, you know, if we have someone who has, 
know, end stage renal disease, we can get them a pig kidney or kidneys, you know, get them maybe off dialysis for a while, which is really harsh on the body. Yeah. Um, and basically buy them time until suitable donor human kidneys can be identified. And in the case of liver, this is even more possible because ex vivo liver perfusion, people who have liver failure, they can be hooked up to livers outside their own body oh. and blood can be filtered through the liver, hmm. um, perfused yeah. as it were. And this has actually been done with pig livers though not genetically modified ones back in the early 90s. Oh, okay. Basically, they had to change out the pig liver every like six to eight hours because oh. they were getting rejected. Yeah. Re so, Re uh, yeah, I mean, that's obviously still the correct word, but they were literally never inside the body. No, Just... no they were attached to. Wow. You may have seen, so this was covered on the front page of the New York Times. They hooked up a pig kidney to a brain dead decedent recipient. Yeah. And show that it, it functioned. Yeah. Huh. Which was, which was great for us in that it brought attention to the field and with attention comes people with money who want to give it to us. But, uh, it wasn't a great experiment. Like we knew the gene they removed would prevent hyperacute rejection. They showed that the kidney functioned until life support was terminated yeah. 56 hours later or what. But mm. yeah, some of this sort of uh, ex vivo experimentation in people has already been done. Wow. And then there was in vivo with Mr. Bennett's case. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned then um, just quickly, and I think, well, let me see what's next. Oh yeah. yeah. I want to go in. Yeah. The process. Um, yeah. But so it Which sounds like I've already talked about, I guess, Yeah. whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, so it sounds like you think there's no place in the future for um, someone having a xenotransplant and then living the rest of their natural life oh. with that. I No, I think there's absolutely a place for that. I see. But I think the more realistic near-term expectation is the bridging approach. Yeah. One of our scientific co-founders likes to say, eventually our pig organs will be so good, everyone will want one just because. <laughs> but he's the guy who wants to bring the woolly mammoth back. So, Ah, wait, wait, who is that? George Church. Ah, yep. Okay. George Church has definitely, I've definitely mentioned George Church before. Um, yeah. He's, oh. he's got ideas. He's, oh, he's got ideas and he's got money. Uh -huh. Or at least he knows how to get money. Yes, he started like two dozen companies. Oh yeah, based on technologies from his lab. Absolutely, he's, I I think the doing... the de-extincting one. He's like founded one company and is on the board or something of the of a second company that does yeah. apparently the same thing. I don't understand what the difference is, but he yeah, founded colossal. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. My feeling on the de-extinction thing is that it's going to be more of a, like an Apollo moon program where the technologies that are developed along the way are going to be things that have the most impact. Like we'll get, you know, some Velcro and GPS. Yeah. Like it, scientifically <laughs> speaking. Velcro but, of the biology world, um, which is kind of PCR, but yeah, absolutely. Kind of sort of, yeah. Um, oh, I, I totally agree. Uh, the 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 passenger pigeon project seems more feasible and is a very interesting like test case uh but yeah i really hope that they just push the boundaries on what we can do to make other molecular biologists lives way easier and cheaper yeah yeah <laughs> and i i think that's gonna be the real upshot of that moonshot yeah like, we don't need to bring woolly mammoths back. Like there's no ecological niche for them. And you know, if you let them loose in Siberia or whatever, like you're disrupting an ecosystem. Mm. Like, you don't know what the consequences of that are going to be. Well, hopefully not like a Jurassic world two type situation. Yeah, three, yeah. no Jurassic world three, but whatever. It was the one where they get loose in 
whatever city. Uh, yeah, something. I, I I barely remember two. I haven't seen three. Although I've been playing the video game, so, you know, at least they can make an entertaining zoo tycoon <laughs> type game. <laughs> I loved Roller Coaster Tycoon. <laughs> um, okay, so, yeah, we did kind of talk about this. I'm on that slide mm-hmm. six, the process. It yeah. it's it sounds so easy when it's in words. Two bullet points. Get rid of what makes it too pig like. Add in yep. some things that make it a little bit more human. Yeah, it uh, sounds it sounds easy, but as you well know, any practicing molecular biologist knows, it's never that simple. <laughs> the vectors that have to be built are on the order of twenty to twenty five kilobases mm. in length. So we have some Yikes. really talented synthetic biologists on the team. Wow, um, that's uh, yeah, that's that's super frustrating. Like not the not the biggest, but it is yeah. up there. And if you have to make multiple, yikes! I'm hearing myself in your. Oh, you are. Yeah, we have uh, made uh, multiple payloads with varying sizes of genes. Yeah. So, yeah, Ranjith and Jackie are wizards at large vector assembly. <laughs> Something I'm trying to do in lab right now. Um, I could use some of their magic because it cloning never wants to work for me. It's a real dark art. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. You're either good at it or more likely you're just bad at it. For no good reason. Yeah, there's no apparent rhyme or reason sometimes. <laughs> All right, but, I want to uh, see what this... Uh... Ah, yeah. So, yeah, do you want to talk about the future of xenotransplants? Um, yeah, how much do you know about, um, yeah, David Bennett? I, 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 so, I followed what was sort of, you know, covered a little news. bit in the press. Yeah, so... Basically, yeah, he was having heart failure, and you know, he wasn't that old, 57. Yeah. I'll be there in 20 years-ish. But uh, he was ineligible for human transplant due to his just generally poor health. Mm. And so the idea was, okay, there's this company that's working with this group at the University of Maryland. they like, okay. Can we, can we try this with the the pig heart? So they got what's called the compassionate use authorization yeah. from the FDA. Basically, they called the FDA and they're like, okay, this guy is clearly not eligible for allo transplant for a variety of reasons. We got this pig heart. We've been doing studies in baboons. Can we, can we do it? And so the FDA was like. Well, if he's going to die anyway, um, have at it. I mean, I'm sure the conversation was a little more nuanced than that. Yeah. That's the gist of it. So this pig from a company called Revivacor. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a name. Yeah. So they are the ones who use the large white breed. Yeah. So this one gene switched off to prevent excessive growth. That's the growth hormone receptor knockout. Oh, I see. They knocked out the same three xenoantigen genes that we do. And they added in six human genes to make the cells look more human. Mm -hmm. So in general, they do a similar thing to us without the perv knockout because they can't do it. Yeah. And they'd probably argue like, oh, we don't know if that's important, but also we can't do it. That's, That's really the, that is kind of the argument. It's like, well, do we have to? It's really hard. <laughs> it is really hard. And that's a real advantage for us in the space because we can make viable pigs that have perv knockout. Yeah. Which requires currently three rounds of somatic cell nuclear transfer. So, wow. <laughs> and at conferences where they've presented, they say they can't do that many rounds. And they're like, well, we can. So, um, Sorry about you. 
just I, I have another question about the the sort of perv knockouts. Um, yeah, how Chris Hansen. the what? Chris Hansen's questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I have I have some questions about Chris Hansen. No, um, uh, how mobile are those elements? So, you know, you know, if you're really good at knocking That's them out, it. right? But do they remobilize at any point? Not that knocking one out would suddenly tell all the others to turn on and move. Well, so that's a good question because so like all retroviruses, they have an envelope protein, a reverse transcriptase, and other like a protease and other things that help yeah. them package into virions. So the way we edit is we drop out the predicted catalytic center of the reverse transcriptase enzyme. Yeah. And this is published, so I can talk about it all I want. So in theory, there should be no mobilization if all copies have been edited, but we have not yet. We're working on some next generation sequencing approaches to assess mobility of the elements yeah. within, well, a given cell and there is concern about recombination between different subtypes of yeah. curves. Yeah. Because so there's type A, type B, type C, and it's been reported that recombinant AC envelope protein uh, causes higher infection rates of human cells. Interesting. But, okay. For whatever reason. So these recombinant curves are of special concern. So we design you know, CRISPR guides or have designed CRISPR guides that will drop out the catalytic region of this reverse transcriptase, which disables, you know, that key step of making an RNA genome yeah. to enable viral packaging once again. Huh. Wow. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know if that answered the question. No, no, that did. I mean, I, I, kind of forgot I, what the question I kind of asked a, like an, probably an unanswerable question, but it sounds like you're working on your, the company yeah. is working on it. I mean, basically, the way I do the experiment, if I had the money, is just uh, sequence a lot in in wild type and knocked out cell uh, Boy, pigs. Boy, how do we sequence a lot? Yeah, and just basically look and see: does a new element show up at any mm -hmm. predict not predictable rate, but any rate that maybe is higher when you've turned off a couple other ones? Yeah, our cotton bio team is hard at work on this with whole genome sequencing yeah. for nanopore and pack bio. Ooh, love love some nanopore. Yeah, it's great stuff. I actually have one sitting on my desk. You got a minion? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's used. Nice. It was used twice. It's leak. It leaked something, so I keep it in this little baggie. Nice. Um, it's a flongal. Yeah. Yeah, we've got one of the grid ions with okay. slightly bigger ones and we're getting a prometheon which is like the huge scale one. Oh, nice we, we do so much nanopore is actually cheaper to buy the fancier instrument than keep buying reagents oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i bet at some yeah. scale um oh yeah. i'd i mean i'd kill to even use one I, I just got this from a friend whose lab had some extra money to do some nanopore sequencing. And I just thought it was cool. I mean, someday I'll do some. They are reusable. Like well, that one was reused. Like, <laughs> did they nuclease flush it and then? I don't know what again. they did. Um, you can only well, use was... the little ones. They were told you can only use reuse a certain number of times, mm -hmm. and they saw a precipitous drop in the number of actual reads they were getting um, after multiple runs. I remember reviewing an NSF grant from someone at Wisconsin who's talking about reusing Minion flow cells for outreach projects. Really? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember who, and I probably shouldn't, probably shouldn't say, say if I did, but I recall that that was a component of their outreach for the NSF Huh. proposal that's very interesting um because yeah, if you don't you know care so much about the quality of the data you can do a nuclease flush after running the instrument for x amount of time and rescue some of the pores for more yeah. reads huh yeah i don't know what they have this this the 
friend lab does. Um, maybe I'll mention that to them. I assume they know about that, and that's what they do. It's just that it, they need yeah. more data than they get out of it. That's yeah. cool. That's interesting. Those You don't get a ton of data out of a Minion. No. But I do like that now they're selling it built into an iPad cover. Oh, oh really? Oh, I didn't realize that. Analyze the data. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the little... Okay, yeah. I don't even know what they call it. Uh, the thing that isn't the flow cell that you plug it into, it's so cheap that they, you know, they sell it. They give it to you for free. It's like a Gillette razor. Yeah. They like give that to you, but you have to yeah. keep buying the cartridges. Yes. Um, the the flongle, I think, is the the thing you put the actual cell into. Yeah. Hmm. But I had not heard yeah, that man. flongle. Flongle. Flow cell dongle. Yes. I think <laughs> well, I don't know what else it would be. Yeah, that, that seems like it tracks. Sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I mean, it's great for, like, environmental hmm. metagenomics. You know, you're, like, just out here sequencing, seeing what we see. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, for, for lab, I have a project in mind that I really want to do that no one's done before. I just need... I need someone to give me their used flow cell that they aren't already going to have used um, to do it. So I'm just waiting around. Um, just need some long, just need some long, long reads. reads. Yep, all that's right. all I need. Well, as long as you don't care too much about accuracy. I don't. That's the best part. <laughs> but we have learned if you do targeted nanopore sequencing and you get real high depth, yeah, the accuracy is no longer a concern because you have so many reads for a given region that it all comes out in the wash. Oh, absolutely. We um we routinely use uh Plasmid Saurus, the company. Oh yeah, we we use them. Yeah, and... ever everyone's using them now that everyone's sort of yeah. like heard about them. And I mean, that's effectively what they do is they it just is. get really high it's kind depth. Of it is kind of funny that they advertise a 1 in 50,000 error rate, which is super misleading because yeah. that's not the error rate of nanopore sequencing. It no. is simply the fact that they over sequence the hell out of something and so can get well, that error rate in the analysis yeah and well you hope they over sequence thing we have sent identical pools of plasma to them and gotten wildly different read depths i mean mm -hmm. one was eight reads and the next one was 500 reads same same prep same pool just just sent two different days so we've had good but mixed yeah randomly results so yeah we've as far as i know had pretty good luck with plasmasaurus primordium labs is also another one that does like nanopore plasmid seek i'm gonna write that down oh you know when you when you've got 20 25 kb vectors you wanna... yeah it, that's effectively what we need or are yeah. needed for so and you can and unlike you know Sanger sequencing an insert or whatever, you can get the whole plasmid sequence to make sure there aren't any backbone errors. Yeah. No. Oh yeah. I f I feel like we're getting a little off track here. With eh, the, whatever. The theme. Talking of science. Right. Yeah, that's true. There's still people listening, so that's that's good. <laughs> yeah. Hope y'all like molecular cloning. <laughs> I talk about molecular biology enough because it's what I do. It's what I love. I think it's very cool. But yeah, let's um. So let's finally get to talking about like the Vidians, the like yeah. the more or less the reason I initially yeah. put out a call and sort of, uh, uh. The, sorry, I'm the laughing reason at for this reason for the streaming. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm laughing at Alt Miss Frizzle derailing the stream. That is my modus operandi. I I constantly derailed myself on stream. So right. it happens all the time. Yeah. So the Vidians, the uh uh shockingly gro gross in terms of what they do and also yes. physicality uh of body, villains body horror in yeah. star trek not not really what you expect to see no but then they did have cronenberg on as an actor um shocking yeah. lack of of body horror but you know shocking lack of use of that character yeah like, definitely like if i don't see a hand turn into a phaser in season five what are you even doing <laughs> Um, so actually, Existence in the 3100s. <laughs> um, so linking, uh, 
Uh, do you have a cat, by the way? I keep seeing a... F a, a, f a I have three cats. I see. I keep seeing are, shapes move behind you that are vaguely cat-shaped. Uh, here. I, I'll unblur. I had blurred because we have a stack of boxes of baby <laughs> stuff because <laughs> we have twins incoming in October. Oh, yeah. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Twin coming. Um. So we'll just yeah. wait for a cat to walk by. Um, yeah. Well, be, we'll be on alert for a cat. Yeah. They'll, they'll be here. One yeah. of them sleeping on a chair over here. <laughs> but yeah, they, they in here. If I didn't have my door closed, I'd have two cats all over me too. Um, anyways, so the Vidians, yes. they are, to link it to the last guest I had on, uh, Devastated by the Phage, a, a kind of ill-defined, but... In, in some ways, a pervasive disease for this species uh, that, that from what I remember reading, destroys skin and organs. Uh, two things that you might need, generally. It's like a, just, it's like a systemic plague kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, they're not all sick with it either, which is something I kind of wish they went more into in terms of like numbers and I, stuff. I really wish they had focused on the Vidians as like the major antagonists of seasons one and two instead of the Kazon. Yeah, definitely. Like, they're so much more interesting than dollar store Klingons. Exactly. I mean, um, especially since they're kind of built to feel both bad for and afraid of. I mean, hmm. their species have been ravaged by a debilitating and... Uh, uh, disfiguring, disfiguring disease. disease for 2,000 years, at least according to Memory Alpha. That's, that's what it says. Um, so in one, in yeah. some ways, you can sort of feel bad for them, right? It's, they, it's kind of like it's a hunchback of Notre Dame situation. Exactly, but a good proportion of an entire species. And yes. that, that's, that's a great societal story, too, because now they're really good at medical technology to the point but where... They oh, yeah. yeah they, they can figure out how to, you know steal others organs and make them work for themselves but they can't actually cure this disease yeah absolutely um experts of xenotransplantation probably yeah. you know they probably have the best <laughs> yeah so when i started thinking about this i realized that by definition the vidians are performing xenotransplantation on yes. themselves because they are stealing Talaxian lungs, they're stealing organs from every species they can get their hands on. And so presumably, well, I would think based on my knowledge of real world xenotransplantation, you know, there would be things on the surface of cells from Talaxians, humans, Klingons, etc. that would be completely foreign to the Vidians. Yeah. And so in order for those pirated organs to work, they would have to very quickly determine what on the surface of those stolen cells causes extreme immune rejection and very quickly disable them. Yeah. It, so. I mean, is, is, are they, I mean, here's a thought also, are they even concerned about, doing something like that what if do, do you think and i don't know um you said you're not an immunologist neither am i but you're closer to one than i am at this point um generous could they uh basically replace their immune systems with their own technology i.e get rid of their immune system transplant whatever they can what take saying, yeah. but supplement the fact that they no longer have an immune system by the fact that their medical technology is is hundreds of years beyond anything that the we see in sort of normal star trek right you know that's i'd say that's like the hand wavy head cannony explanation for how they're <laughs> able to do what they do that's what i do like here the, I, no I, I would agree like they have some some way of making it work yeah. And like it's possible that the phage has just completely destroyed their native immune system. 
but I guess, you know, playing at a hypothetical here, like do Vidians get a cold? Like, do they yeah. pick, get the flu? Do they have, you know, minor illnesses that aren't the phage? So they need something to deal with because those would be exceptionally devastating in an already extremely debilitated individual. Yeah. Like a, a phage patient, a phage shint. <laughs> I mean, my, person. sorry, so, not, not, uh, this is a, yeah. Um, total headcanon, but you know, my argument would be, you know, in their, in their, in their attempts to combat the phage, they've invented every other technology that you might ever want. Like, uh, you know, uh, transporters can filter out biological things that aren't meant to be there. Well, you know, what if they have basically the same screeners every time they walk in and out a door? Right. And the only thing it can't filter out is the phage for whatever for whatever reason. For story reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I like. I just had an idea. What about what if CRISPR but transporter? Like, what if you could? you know, transport out a specific segment of DNA or transport in a specific segment of DNA to an organism's genome. Yeah. I mean, they, they're, you know, they could do that uh, therapeutically, but also their, their preferred method of method of organ piracy is to transplant them straight out. You know, you program in a subroutine right there, like during transplant, you're already doing some of the gene editing you do because, you know, that organ yeah. ha has a recipient waiting. So do you think... I'll, I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess my, yeah, my question, can we even... Uh, uh, they're aliens in a fictional series, but if their biology is, is you know, they're the same... Uh, they're molecules of the same chirality as us. They have DNA. They have proteins. They have they have lipid membrane, bilayer membranes. What is there a is there a a ceiling or a basement, depending on which way you go, to um, immunogenic compatibility or cross or anti compatibility? Right. Right. At some point. You know, throwing in a lizard organ is the same thing as throwing in a fish organ is the same thing as, you know what I mean? I just feel like, you know, we're talking about species that have evolved in yeah. very different parts of the galaxy, especially when we're talking about the Voyager crew. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know about Neelix, but <laughs> probably Neelix is probably more related to the Vidians than any of the other crew members. But I still think that organisms from such a different part of space, a different quadrant, unless we're going distant origin here, <laughs> um, would still have some level of, some baseline level of incompatibility with the Vidians. Yeah. Whether or not that's you know, pre exist it's probably not going to be pre-existing antibodies no. like there are in humans against pigs, but there's going to be something that yeah. triggers the, this is foreign response if the immune system is still present. But again, we can speculate, tell the cows come home about the crazy good medical technologies that the Vidians have come up with that would allow them to basically in transport, uh, perform immune matching and gene editing. Yeah. Um, I mean, they were able to split Volana Torres on a genetic ancestral line, like, which yeah. doesn't, which is it's a whole other thing. Yeah. I also don't think Spock could have viable offspring. No. Oh, a lot of people shouldn't have viable offspring. Um, well, but this this kind of goes into another thing we were chatting about, which yeah. is you know biological compatibility. Yeah, like Spock is basically a mule. He's a hybrid of two species. We don't know how many chromosomes Vulcans are supposed to have. And even if we did, they probably shouldn't pair with human chromosomes. So right, like 
horses have like 64 and donkeys have 62 chromosomes so your mule ends up with 63 chromosomes and so that leads to a whole ton of non-disjunction yeah um yes yes oh. the, beat, the transporting out is easy head cannon for sure <laughs> i mean i'll buy it you know yeah um, we're, we're trying to apply a, a factual lens to this guy on screen here. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, their, their medical technology is amazing, but their uh, uh, ability to apply grafts seems, and their, their plastic surgery seems to be a little lacking. Yeah. So they're when, not a vain when, species. When Fred Durst's face showed up, that was very disturbing. <laughs> baby, oh, baby Wildman, oh, yeah. Yeah. I forget. yeah, she's kind of... That's, that's a whole other thing because that's just, yeah. that's a, okay, two different species, but entirely different gestational yeah. needs. Yes. Yeah, there's probably a whole other stream to mine on reproductive compatibility or not yes. between alien species. Yes. That that is that is a stream that I want to do in the future. Absolutely, I have a uh, someone I have in mind who who really likes um, uh, meiosis. So that's someone to talk to. Definitely. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, which which this is this topic though is still related because one thing is is okay you have. Whether you're a Vidian trying to get a uh, a human organ or a uh, human and a Vulcan having a child together, the compatibility of the biology of the two things you're slamming together, I I just don't understand. I don't understand what are they doing. Um, it, it does suggest a just a level of. Um, well, we yeah. could go back to that episode of TNG, The Chase, where, uh, yeah, you know, that whatever they call themselves, you know, seeded the galaxy with yeah. humanoid life, uh, but whatever. Uh, Volpezia, you should definitely uh, follow if you want to get updates for when I do that. <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, that, that is the ultimate, like, um, I don't even know what the word is they like they said that and then now everyone can just point back to that and say yeah, it's a it's a macguffin yeah it's like it, a, a, a macguffin yeah or i think the trope one big lie like if you buy this then everything like in star trek there are two big lies there's warp travel and there's <laughs> transportation so oh yeah <laughs> if you're if you're willing to buy into these things then it's all fine yeah um that episode i i like but it gets evolution so wrong first of all i like the idea of a genetic element that f that for whatever reason like encode the way they say it they like encodes for peptides the peptides um they say without meaning this like are fitting together in a program well if you were advanced enough and you could uh a make uh predicted peptide sequences that bind to each other in, in pockets and, and then had the spermia, the Riker theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like the idea of like what they did, but the, it, it also suggests that every species on every planet that they've encountered has the capacity to become a humanoid. Huh. Right. So, so this is why every planet has humans with loaf. Yeah, exactly. That's like, it just depends on which particular species decided to become a bipedal humanoid first. Or or rather, better? I don't know. Yeah, it's... I don't know. Trying to retcon that is more than my brain wants to do. Yeah, and... and it's, it's an easy hand wave, sure. Especially, yeah. I mean, also, we're talking... Let's go back to this though. Humans and pigs. How many mi millions of years of evolution are separate us? Like, I want to just guess 50. 50 million years. I'm just going to Google that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, uh, 
If you weren't going to, I was going to. Okay. We last shared a common ancestor with pigs about 80 million years ago. Oh, I, I underdid it. Still, Close, 80 million is, f is far less than the like 1.5 billion years since life began on our planet and presumably the Vidian planet and every other planet, right? So... Vidya Prime. Vidya, yeah, probably Vidya Prime. Um, or Vidya 6. It's never just... You know, right? Um, we, we evolved. We evolved on Soul Three. Yeah, that, a much better. Uh, since since our planet's name means dirt, it's I I like Soul Three. It's a very humble planet name. All dirt bags, <laughs> ugly bags of mostly water, <laughs> as um, they called us that one time. What was that from? The the silicon based. Uh, life form and that home soil was that the home episode soil i'm remembering everything but the actual home soil start okay ah oh yeah yes ugly giant bags of mostly water um the crystal life form describing yes. humans i remember uh uh it interesting that they have a concept of beauty and that they decided to apply it to us um i well, remember that now oh season one that's why i don't remember it so well yeah. it's yes. uh, one of those ones i skip every time i rewatch. yeah season one has some real lows but there's some really good stuff in it i find yeah there is there definitely is like if we could just strike code of honor from the record forever yeah. yeah yeah code of honor uh, needs to be forgotten was that heart of glory where the klingons are assembling weapons from pieces of their uniforms that one's really cool oh yeah 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 i remember that and then oh. we have conspiracy i saw I, yeah i saw a uh <laughs> i saw a flutter go by Stand by everyone for cat. Hope your Thursday nights are going well. Oh. And she lets me hold her like a baby. Oh. oh. This is Ruthie. Oh, oh. Yeah, Ruthie. She's so cute. Oh. I don't know if you could hear me, but I said she's very cute. She's she knows it that's the problem yeah that's what our cats yep same yeah uh they're too smart for their own good yeah something i like the time delay on that's fun you can see her like get tired of me <laughs> <laughs> um yeah uh let's see how are we doing on time oh it's only nine forty. okay that's great um yeah, so, yeah, do you have any other thoughts about the Vidians? I mean, I feel like it, it's, it's, this is the strange thing about this and other science, science fiction topics, right? It's like the core of it, it's really good. It's really close. The idea is there, um, but they have a framework they have to work in, right? It's, it's yes. Star Trek, right? They have to deal with that fact, um, and they have to make it fun and a good story, and they have to be villains right. because of how the story needed them. But still, that kernel of truth is still it's there. very present. Yeah. And I you know, it would be great to have that deep exploration of a society that is completely committed to the mission of improving medical technology to cure <laughs> this devastating disease. But yeah. That's not the most entertaining TV. No. Though it is uh, a very Star Trek premise. I mean, I mean that right there. The the whole episode where Belana Torres gets split in two. The premise of that is it's a scientific inquiry that they got mm -hmm. that she got caught up in. Uh, yeah. Which again and, still like makes a little bit not sense. Like, why would learning how Klingons fight the yeah. disease help them? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess they were trying to figure out. You know, is 
is there something in another species physiology that would allow yeah. them to be resistant or cure it? I guess with sufficiently just... advanced technology, medical technology, mm -hmm. uh, the limiting factor is the breadth and, and, um, ingenuity that just that only billions of years of evolution can provide of just of just you know endless sort of molecular forms you know what i mean like finding that enzyme that does a function that you cannot possibly predict because yeah, you don't know what you're looking for right it, it would be casting it would be a fishing expedition but your net would be so big that you ought to catch something exactly i mean yeah and the splitting of a hybrid organism into its constituent species. I, I mean, a, I a normal transporter in TNG by it's simply... Inexplicable. Yeah, and by simply removing a certain percentage of mass turns you into a child because that's how aging works. You, you don't actually... Nothing happens. You just gain no. more mass. Yes, kids are just tiny adults. That's how it works. <laughs> But yeah, sorry, I, I, I cut you off whether or not you had any like additional thoughts on like the Vidians oh. or any of that. Oh, yeah, I think that about covers it. You know, I think the head cannon that they have extremely advanced transporter based medical technology can explain away any immunological <laughs> incompatibilities that my, you know, logical, excuse me, my logical brain tries to combat, but. And I guess yeah. if, as long as they're similar enough, right? If, if they need oxygen, they just need an organ that, that helps gas diffuse across a membrane. Yeah. And who knows if the organs that are in their bodies are even performing the same function. Yeah. Yeah. But you make it, you make a good point. Like, do they have blood or do they have, the pond where you're scraping your genetic information from has an answer you know you want to find, but you don't know. Fishing. Oh, at, yeah. You're fishing at the lobster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. You, you might get snapped, that's for sure. Um, I kind of wish, this makes me think, just thinking more about the Vidians. Yeah, now it makes me, like, if they ever brought them back, you know, bring them back completely healthy, but then they Early have this sensory videos. But then they have, you know, um, have all this medical technology and maybe they get kind of used to having organs that gave them a little bit more like pep in their step. They, that allowed them to eat whatever they want and never gain weight. And suddenly they like, it becomes true <laughs> organ piracy or something like that. Right. Designer it's, organs. It's pretty good for shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Disco Vidians. That would be a heck of a callback. Yeah, that really I mean, would. Well, we know they look like bog standard loafy humans because of the doc's uh, uh, br brush. Dr. Pell? Denara Pell, was that her name? Yeah, I think that sounds yeah. familiar from. Yeah, this loafy humans standard. But yeah, it would be very interesting to see a. A future Vidian society that is back to its former glory, I guess. Mm -hmm. It might get me to watch season five of Discovery. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen Strange New Worlds? Yes, I have. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. They. It's just very good, but. I almost feel like it suffers a little bit from the lack of serialization, which is the exact opposite complaint I have of Picard and Disco. <laughs> like, I really want to know what the hell's going on with Cybok. But yeah, I I mean, hopefully, if they we'll get, get a couple seasons, they'll you know they'll get there. They're doing serialization in the way I I tend to prefer it, which is that we are allowed time to sort of forget what's going on. For a little bit, for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hammer not dead. That's yeah. My, That's. My hope. Oh. Yeah. Well, I know. 
He yeah. said Bruce Horak said he's going to be back, but what that means. It might not mean much for Star Trek since they have a they they reuse people all the time. Sometimes yeah. for very similar characters, especially in Discovery. They, I mean, of course, yeah, they had Kenneth Mitchell loafed up as one of the Klingons, and then he was Invigilator Aurelio, whatever the hell. I don't that even was. remember that. Yeah. It was kind of sad though because the actor had a it's like muscular dystrophy and it progressed really fast so his character had to be in a in a chair. Oh, interesting. Huh. And when and when they were there was a part where they were listing off ship names and they had like the USS Yelchin cuz you know Anton Yelchin and Yes. We did the USS Mitchell which was for Kenneth Mitchell. Huh. Because of his condition. And then the USS Nog, of course, which was <laughs> brought a tear to the eye. Yeah. No. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Show us some future videos, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> They're out there. They unless they all died yeah. from phage. What? That's uh, you know, that could have also happened. That could have also happened. I because I don't I just, think I don't think they were cured. That's like one thing that they didn't solve. They just kind of stopped being they got out of video in space, I think. Something like that, yeah. It was it was the bathtub episode. They, the doctor got in contact with Denara Pell, and they had some treatment for the virus or whatever it was that was causing them to be stuck on planet Cialis. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, and of course, because their technology is so advanced, but not advanced enough, they had the cure. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, like we've been we've been there we've done that yeah so. <laughs> we've had that disease that's not our problem oh yeah make was... it less your problem <laughs> and that was the last time that they showed up right i think so i think so yeah 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 i wish they had been used more in the first couple of seasons yeah but that is written so I'm sure there's some book out there, expanded. Oh, I'm sure. Trek book where they're main characters or something like that. Yeah, I don't care if it's not canon. <laughs> <laughs> I I sort of do only in that I don't want to read a bunch of books to keep canon straight in my head. Prefer to just have yeah. what's on on TV be canon. Yes, I. There's already so much of it. I just it has to be contained some in yeah. some fashion. And. And the contortions that happen, like Michael Burnham as Spock's adopted sister, like all of those kind of contortions make it very confusing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Sarek's a kind of a shitty dad, isn't he? Oh, de definitely one of the worst, even He's even like by Vulcan standards. Three. Yeah. He's like 0 for 3, pretty much. <laughs> but... Um. Yeah, yeah, Spock, Cybok, Michael, and Michael. Yeah, there's. I don't. I give it a non-zero chance that another Sarek child shows up in someday, someday, someday. Hammer. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Somebody was requesting a slash fit called Mourn Hammer <laughs> in the hood Discord. Really. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's, um, oh that's very specific. Speaking, speaking of cross species compatibility. Yeah. Um, oh, the think tank. Oh, right. Space Costanza episode. Space Costanza. I forgot about yeah. think tank. Yeah. Mentions that. Oh, just mentions that they're cured. Now I have to look this up. Yeah. I'll well, we'll get there. And... Uh, that's that's kind of the worst way to do it just offhand mentioned oh yeah, yeah season five episode 19 we're so smart we did this thing oh my gosh the the picture on oh my god lofi jason <laughs> yeah i gotta put this up it's it's so awful is it gonna appear for me <laughs> probably not everybody just go to memory alpha and there we go think tank 
So that is something that I don't like in sci-fi is when they have literally a universe of possibilities and they just write it, write it away. Offhand. Yeah. 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 I also, when it wasn't required, like we could have learned that they were very smart via any other means. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a shorthand for how smart they are. That's for sure. A very writerly, uh, Sorry, Jason Alexander loafed up. Yeah, he, it's, uh, it's metal hair is just too much. It's pretty awful. Um, and that was post ninety nine. So post um, after Seinfeld, Seinfeld yeah. Um, uh, I'm I'm just double checking because I didn't didn't look before on to, I, today. I didn't look whether there was any more informa- information on the phage. Um, I think not, unfortunately. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, Embus, uh, welcome. Also, thank you for gifting five subs to Altmus Frizzle. Uh, uh-oh. Why does she know Kisetsu? I've seen you before. Charlotte, Invisible Dimension and Ramirez Plays. Wow. I also didn't know that you were in chat. Welcome. Oh my gosh. I do need to be going. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. The, Thank you been, for this has joining. Been fun. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to bat this ball around. With you. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, I just I'm sorry. I'm getting more sounds in my ears. I'm trying to figure out why. Okay. What is happening? I think I think it's just my alerts is is doing something weird. Okay. Okay. Um, Cool. Sorry, sorry. You were trying to say goodbye. <laughs> yeah. No, if you need to get going. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. coming on. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you for you having me. This was fun. Yeah. Thank you for talking about uh, your work, the 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 field. Um, yeah. And also batting around the problem of of the Vidians. <laughs> Vidianing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you are uh, uh, yeah ever interested in coming back. Just let me know, or more likely, I will bother you for another chat on something sure. someday. Sounds good to me. Awesome. Just yeah. let me know. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good night. Thank I'm you. sure everyone you appreciates too. it. Bye. Everybody. All right. Let me uh, switch some things up real quick. Actually, no, this is just going to be the easiest way to do this. Uh, Embus, uh, that was overly generous and also you scared me so so thank you uh all right gotta get these have you been lurking for long get these out of the way okay so unfortunately um uh if i try to mess with my setup right now a little bit too much i'll probably end up breaking it um uh, also, Volpezia, thank you for uh, stopping by. Um, I'm glad you had fun. Uh, yeah, MSU, and you dropped in just at the end of stream, unfortunately. Um, hopefully, if you weren't able to catch much of it, you're able to check out the VOD later. Uh, Dr. Z was fantastic, who might still be watching, for all I know, in case he didn't uh, close uh, the Twitch window immediately. Um virtual hug oh a heart it took a second to pop up on my screen um yeah i don't know what else to say they yeah the vidians are a crazy crazy species i love a story that's about a a just perpetually sick sci-fi species i'm trying this the vidians all today reminded me of a book i read where the main species was sick and i'm trying to think of who it was and i cannot think for the life of me of what that book was so i can't recommend it unfortunately um the vidians are also a more body horror version of the stargate at uh uh asgard there they are there they are my brains zonking out for the night um oh a bit of a bit of eye chat um 
chat lag. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's also OBS. OBS BS. Uh, sometimes you'll put it, people will put in like emotes or something like that and it will show the words and then it takes a second and catches up. Uh, I think it's more OBS because it, it looks fine when I look at the screen of what's actually being streamed. Um, yeah, I can't think of I, I'm 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 floundering here because I can't think of those other organ organ harvesting uh, uh, creeps that I read about once. Uh, anyways, I will um, definitely share these two papers that Dr. Z shared with me. Um, so I'll put that on Discord in case anyone wants to read them. I'm definitely going to read um, this one specifically to get a get a little bit of background into the genome engineering of pigs. Uh, I had no clue that we were still not still that we were that we were uh, cloning the way that Dolly was cloned, um, cloning pigs. Uh, but I guess it makes sense if you want to make a series of of not increasingly convoluted, but just a, a, a increasing series of mutations um, in those pigs. All right. So I will share these, but unfortunately, it's going to have to be the end of the night for me. I'm going to press a button quick. I think it might turn off my camera. It absolutely did, but you can still probably hear me. Hold on. I'm still here. No, that's not it. Trying to get my camera to work, which is uh, super annoying right now. Why aren't you working? Window capture. I guess I'm going to just stay like this for the rest of the stream. Uh, Alt Miss Frizzle, you remember briefly reading about this as part of um, your senior capstone class um, as something you could research on as an application for reproductive tech. Oh really? Oh interesting. See, I stay away from the the, the um, big animals, especially vertebrates, um, specifically. So I did not know that we had um, this kind of technology. I honestly thought that what you had to do was edit a pig, grow that pig up, get little piglets, then you edit those piglets, etc., etc., etc. This does make it a lot easier to find those transformants. So molecular cloning is not fun. Um, and CRISPR, although fantastic, uh, doesn't happen as uh, not quickly. What's the right word? Get out of here. As easily as you might as you might hope. Uh, you had to you had to learn how to do somatic cell nuclear transfer and other things. Uh, one of your professors gene edited pigs, but for other things. Oh, really? Interesting. Oh, that's cool. Um, that's awesome. I So you learned how to do, uh, I'm just going to call it SCNT. Um, were you doing like micro injections or something like that? I might have to sit down on probably Sunday and learn about that. Probably watch a couple of YouTube videos like on stream or something like that. I'd really love to learn a little bit more. Um, okay. Anyways, I will share these immediately after turning off stream. I'm going to raid somebody, so stick around. I don't know who's on yet. Uh, Let's see, two reminders slash announcements. On Wednesday, um, I'm talking to the creator of Bibites, the evolution simulation game. And then I believe that following Sunday, um, I'll be talking with David Hewitt, uh, actor and, and star of Stargate Atlantis, among other things. We're not talking about Stargate. 
um, but we're going to talk about genetic engineering, biotechnology, stuff like that. Um, I think he's coming on my screen, stream, but I might be coming on his. We'll find out. Also, James Gurney, well, I have to ask him, but I, I'm going to see if James Gurney is around to pop on too. Um, oh, it's a desirable skill in agriculture for being able to clone high-value animals like million-dollar beef cows. <laughs> wow. Okay, I did not know there were million-dollar beef cows. I thought we just, you know, made cows the old-fashioned way. But, you know, whatever. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, thanks for sharing, Alt Miss Frizzle. Uh, uh, Volpezia, thank you for stopping by. I'm glad you had fun. Uh, Embis, again, thank you uh, very much for the gifted subs uh, to, what is it, five? Yeah, five. Wow. Amazing. Too generous. Those subs will go towards a new microscope someday. Maybe. Getting a lot more subs for that, though. But I've been looking around at some better microscopes. Okay. Let's look and see who is on to raid. Raid, raid, raid. Oh, homozygotes on. Other Marcus. Oh, wow. He's got 38 people right now. He's so popular. Uh, we'll raid him. I'm going to have to head off pretty soon, though. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Stick around for the raid. Uh, good night. Oh. Oh, Miss Frizzle, that's where I'm going. But good night, everybody. Or not like not not using like super technical language and trying to make it interesting and trying to make it a story with the narrative and like not just being like you know super technical uh, about it because that's like the st the stem lords <clears throat> like that shit but a lot of people are just like what and they just move on like most people don't read the newspaper and or like when they most people who read uh, articles they like read the first paragraph so you have to really try to you know suck people in unless it's about drama you know like the local county commissioner being an asshole then they'll read that <laughs> <laughs> so we should turn it into key. drama yeah maybe just I like, should just be like uh um Tucker Carlson, like, cut it like a real, uh, like, mudslinging ad. Tucker Carlson wants to tell you that inflation is the reason that gas is so high. But could it be that the entire Republican Party actually voted against?